If you're still there, okay, that's, that's good. So uh, I would li I'd like to try to do a very hard task, so to speak about the ionosphere in one hour. So it's a very, very hard task. So but first of all, I would like to thank uh, Claudio, Lucilla, Yuri, Professor Sandra Dicella, who uh, some of these, uh, these slides are, are being stolen by them, uh, from them. And then part of them have been inspired by the lesson given by Professor Michael Mendillo in a school we had some years ago. So I'd like to start with some kind of history. So everything began with the electromagnetic theory of James Clerk Maxwell. And in, 1990, in 1899, Guglielmo Marconi invented the first radio telegraph, sending signals across the English Channel. Then everything changed in uh, 1901, because there was a transatlantic radio signal transmitted from Cornwall to um, New Newfoundland in, uh, in Canada, and it was the first transmission using the ionosphere as a medium to transmit the signal, and for that Marconi was awarded with the Nobel Prize in, uh, in a few years ago, a few years after, sorry. Of course, we didn't talk at that time, they didn't talk about ionosphere, the term ionosphere arrived slightly later. Uh, the, 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 the theory of uh, an atmospheric layer uh, of ionized air uh, called the kennelly heaviside layer uh, was theorized by, by them a uh, few years after. Now we call it that ionosphere. And then uh, the existence of the ionospheric layer has not been proved until the 1924, thanks to research of uh, uh, Edward Appleton, okay? So this is the little bit of framework of the history of ionosphere. But today I would like to, uh, to, to bring you into this, into this journey to, to build the, the ionosphere. So first of all, we have to know what we have to, to cook together. So what's the ionosphere? The ionosphere is a plasma, good news, uh, but it's not a very peculiar plasma because it's a plasma able to influence the propagation of radio waves from kilohertz to gigahertz range. It's globally neutral. The density of ion electron is very low with respect to the neutral density. It's a cold plasma, so it means that the collision energy can be neglected in most of the cases. It has its own uh, frequency, um, plasma frequency, and this plasma frequency uh, depends on the density of the free electron characterizing that plasma, and they have a, a big variation in terms of space and time. And there are relative maxima and minima of electron density that identify the various ionospheric regions or layers. The ionosphere somehow, as you may see from this figure, is the ionize a counterpart of the thermosphere covering a range uh, between roughly 50 kilometers up to 1,000 and, and more. Okay, that's what we have to cook. So, a good recipe for, uh, for the Earth's ionosphere, this is the doses for one planet. So you have to sprinkle a generous amount of photoionization. You need plasma, so you need photoionization. So, Photoionization is the process. You have uh, some molecules, some atoms. You need photons with a given energy. So H is the Planck constant with their, and nu is the, uh, ni is the frequency of, that, uh, of the photons. And if the energy has exactly the, 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 the quantum needed for the, for the photoionization, you create an excited version of the atoms plus an electron. So you extract an electron from, the, from that. So somehow, if you want to photoionize a part of the atmosphere, you need the two ingredients. The first ingredients are the neutral. So you need to know the composition of your neutral atmosphere. Here you may see a good approximation. So the most abundant um, uh, species, species in, the, in the atmosphere are the oxygen and the nitrogen, the molecular hydrogen, without the good composition made by uh, hydrogen, oxygen, molecular oxygen, and helium. This is somehow reflect the fact that um, aviest um, species are going to lower, uh, lower altitude. This is because of the, of the gravity. And then you need some photons, good photons. And there is the sun, luckily. 
So, uh, of course, you need photons that have exactly the energy you need to make the, to make the electron pass from one orbital to the other. And here you can see the, uh, the energy needed that is, quant quant uh, that is a specific quantum of energy here reported also in terms of the specific wavelength that that photon must have to enable the photo ionization, okay? That's good. So let's imagine, let's put, let's put ourselves in a simple case. So we have just an atmosphere made by oxygens, oxygen. So we need a, a photon uh, with a wavelength of uh, 910 uh, angstrom to produce an ionized uh, uh, an O plus plus an electron. So in the um, Chapman theory, and we're going to tell more about that in a, in a few slides, uh, the production function is the sum of the uh, distribution of the concentration of oxygen with the altitude and the radiance as a function of the, the capacity of the, of, the, uh, of the solar radiation to penetrate in the various layers in the, in, the, in the atmosphere. So how do you imagine, what shape do you imagine for this? It's not that hard to imagine because if you think about the concentration of neutrals, so they go up, they, they, they go down with the altitude, okay? And what do you imagine for the, uh, for the radiance as a function of altitude? It goes like this because the photons tend to be, um, tend to be absorbed by the various layer of the atmosphere going down and then you, have, you can imagine a distribution of the solar irradiance as a function of altitude which has this form. So, if you want to convolve these two functions, you get this. That is a beautiful ionospheric layer. That's a beautiful, very simple model, mono, uh, with a mon mono, um, with a, with a single, uh, single uh, species, you know, single species inside, ionospheric layer. What you can do actually is to uh, try to make something more, a little bit complicated, but the theory is always the same. So if you imagine a single composition, you can obtain what is called a Chapman layer, and you see there the, uh, ex uh, the expression of the um, electron density as a function of the altitude, as a function of the LTI. And here you can see uh, some important uh, factors, of course, you need to, need to take into account the rate of photoionization and the solar zenith angle, which is somehow it's the angle, um, gives you the idea that how the sun is efficient in uh, transferring photons from the sun to the, to the, um, to the atmosphere. And uh, I deleted uh, that part, which is called recombination rate, because we are going to call to talk about recombination in a while. But at the beginning, you can think that you have something that depends on the neutral density, it depends on the, uh, of the irradiance, and somehow also dependence on the solar zenith angle. This is the most simple ionospheric layer you may think of. Let's start to complicate a little bit more the things. So you need also to take into account that uh, there is a cross-section, of course, so the efficiency of the photons to really cre actually create uh, um, uh, ionization in the, in, the, in the plasma. And if you have uh, a photon uh, characterized by a, a wavelength which is large and that the, uh, the one needed for the ionization, there is no photoionization. Of course, if it's uh, smaller, you will have the photoionization, plus some extra energy. So in theory, you may have uh, an energetic photoelectron with a, a specific kinetic energy. Yet you can call it e, e, e star. So if this extra energy is again larger than ionization potential, you can create a secondary ionization. So a very energetic photon can lead to several ion electron pairs. So you can have just primary and secondary ionizations. And this is again just in the case of a single species, a single species, species. So if we want to take into account and we want to consider a complete photoionization, we have to take into account 
the full irradiance from the sun and the full um, density of the, um, of the various species as a function of the, the decomposition of the neutral atmosphere. If you remember, this is on the left, you will see the, um, the solar flux on the various, uh, on the various uh, wavelength and frequencies, and also here reported for two different levels of the, of, the of the solar activity, so the solar maximum and solar minimum. And the other side, you, I've, I have reported here again uh, the composition of the neutral atmosphere. If you remember the table I showed you before about the, um, the wavelength needed for the photoionization, you will see that the, um, the range of wavelength creating the ionization of the species uh, in, the, in, the upper layer, in the upper layers of the ionosphere are in the range between the X-ray and the UV ray, okay? Um, and these are, again, I've reported the, uh, the main uh, the main uh, sources of the primary ionization in the, in the ionosphere. Okay, so that's the first, uh, the first ingredient. What's the second ingredient? We have to add an almost uniform dusting of particle precipitation around the magnetic pole. So, so beside the, uh, the, solar, the, the solar irradiance, there is another source of ionization. The fact that as both um, Stefan and Fabian already demonstrated you, the system, the Earth system is not closed. See the Earth, the Earth ionosphere in terms of currents, it's exposed to magnetosphere. It's directly connected the ionosphere to, the, to, the, to, the, to the magnetosphere and the solar wind. So it, it, it's open, especially under specific condition to the penetration of particles that create currents and create, and the particles are, precipitating at lower, um, alt at lower altitude and may reach ionospheric altitude. In particular, if you see this plot, precipitating electrons, uh, this is at the distribution of a function altitude of the um, ionization rate for different energies of the precipitating electron, can create an additional source of ionization affecting mostly the zone that you have seen before. So the zone characterizing the auroral oval. So the auroral precipitation oval. Hmm? Okay, so photoionization is the first ingredient. Uh, particle precipitation is an additional source. What's missing? We have to add a wise dose of chemistry. Why? Why a wise dose of chemistry? because we put too much ionization in our, in our receipt. Why? If we consider just the production, and we consider, for instance, the case of the oxygen, and this is uh, a model of the, uh, of the production rate by considering just for the ionization of the oxygen, we may consider that at the peak uh, ionization rate, we have kind of 4,000 electrons per, per um, cubic centimeter per second. So if we wait three hours, for instance, so about 10 to the fourth seconds, we have a maximum uh, density of uh, four times 10 to the seven electron per, cubics, uh, per uh, cubic centimeter. That has been never measured. It's really too high. So something happened. So some, 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 uh, some electrons must be somehow, something happens to these ions and electrons. And the answer is the chemistry. So the plasma recombination and some plasma, neutral plasma processes must be taken into account to, to complete the, the picture. What I mean is that, for instance, we can have uh, electronic capture. So some excited oxygen can capture an electron and create, and going back to the, to the, to the Atomic state, this is very rare because you need exactly an electron which have very peculiar, uh, peculiar energy. So then it's a very peculiar um, wavelength. So the 910 um, angstrom I was mentioning before. Another case can be the capture of electron by um, um, molecular, uh, um, molecular ions of oxygen. 
this is fast, it's a quite a fast process, or we can have the process involving the um, uh, excited oxygen plus molecules of nitrogen and oxygen, creating excited states of uh, oxygen, uh, NO, sorry, oxy, oxy, okay, I don't remember the name, the name, NO plus, NO plus, they can further decay, they're transform into um, oxygen and electrons in excited states. And it's a slow process. And of course, when there are processes that, have, that are characterized by this two-stage process, they are slower. The effect, the net effect, is that the recombination plays an important role. It can be so slow that makes the uh, ionosphere existing also during the night time, so when the, where the main source of uh, its creation is not there anymore. And of course, uh, the ratio, for instance, of the uh, oxygen and uh, N2 provide, uh, it's, an it's an essential quantity that provides some knowledge about the ionospheric state because the density of the oxygen affects the production rate in the F region and the lifetime of the oxygen at F region is governed by this disso dissociative recombination with N2. So somehow, if you want to know about the chemistry that is going on, that is changing the status of the or your ionization, you have to monitor, you have to keep track of the ratio between the oxygen and the molecular nitrogen. So again, the same plot. I have reported there the main source of recombination. And of course, the real case, it's more complex. So many chemical reactions uh, happening in the ionosphere and a more complex picture. And the actual case, it's almost like that. So on the left part, you will see the various sources of uh, the various uh, ionized species in the, in the ionosphere. On the right, you will see the density of the neutral one, which as you may see, they are more dense than the um, and then the, the, then the, um, excited, uh, the excited counterparts. And the electron density distribution, which is the black profile you will see there, it's mainly driven by the electron density distribution of ionized, the, sorry, the ionized oxygen. And when you have the peak at around uh, 300 kilometers, it's uh, the uh, O plus that is dominant. At lower altitudes, going below uh, 150 kilometers, the major ions are O+, plus, O2+, plus, and NO+. Plus. And at higher latitude, it's the uh, lighter, are the lighter elements that dominate, in specifically the, uh, the hydrogen, the excited hydrogen, which, make the which mark the transition toward the protosphere and plasma sphere. So the most clear uh, the most striking feature of this uh, composition, the of combination of various species is that the ionosphere, the plasma, has a structuring, it's vertical structuring. And in particular, you may recognize here in blue and red, the various layers that compose the ionosphere. Um, on the right, in red, there you have uh, the typical daytime ionosphere, which is composed by four layer, D layer, E layer, F1, and F2. And a less structured ionosphere is in during the nighttime, with just the E layer and F layer. And uh, here you also see something that you will see many times during these days, the fact that there is a GNSS satellite, the satellite there, which has some signal that passes to the wall, a ionosphere, and keep memory of many things. But the most important part is the total electron content, which is the integral of the electron density along the ray path connecting the GNSS satellite and the receiver. You will learn a lot about instrument. You will learn a lot about EC in the next day. So start to be familiar with that. OK. Let's say a few words about the ionospheric layer. So the, 
The D layer is located at about 60 to 90 kilometer. The production mechanism is mainly the daytime ionization of NO due to solar Lehman alpha at that specific wavelength. The loss is due to recombination in complex ions. It has the characteristics to absorb the lower radio frequency. So some instruments are not able, for instance, radar located at ground that are called ionoson, um, are not able to reveal the D, the D layer of the ionosphere and disappear right after sunset, after sunset because there the density is such that their combination is completely uh, mm, um, able to uh, make the, the layer disappear. Then there is the E layer from about 90 to 140, 150 kilometer. Um, the production mechanism is the daytime ionization of O2 and the particle precipitation in the high latitude sector. If you remember, the penetration of the particle precipitation was at about, as a maximum, at a maximum of about 150 kilometer. And the loss is through the recombination in modular ions, and it's also reduced by the, um, uh, by, by molecular ions, and it's, it's com strongly driven by the solar zenith angle, as I mentioned in the, in the Chapman layer. In fact, it actually behaves quite nicely as a Chapman layer. The F1 layer is the, uh, from about 140 and 200 kilometers. Please don't, don't take this number as very strict. It's just, just rough. They, they change a lot. And uh, the production is the daytime ionization of, of oxygen and the loss is recombination of NO plus and electrons. And okay, you, it tends also to behave like a Chapman layer. And the F2 layer, which goes up to the 1000 kilometers and more and has a peak typically at about 300, 350 kilometer. As I mentioned before, the daytime ionization uh, of, electro of oxygen is the main production. The loss is the O plus reaction we know N N2 and recombination of NO plus and electrons. And it is also significantly affected by transport and diffusion processes, which make the F layer uh, deviate, deviates from the ideal behavior of Chapman layer. Okay. Now we need to season it all with a strong internal magnetic field because the magnetic field has an important role in the, in the ionosphere formation, morphology, and dynamics. We know now, but also even before, that the Earth has a magnetic field. The magnetic field is nearly uh, vertical at the, uh, at the poles and it's nearly horizontal at the equator. And um, it plays a significant role, especially at mid-latitude, for what concerns the fact that uh, the neutral winds are mostly horizontal and the plasma is constrained to move along the magnetic field line. So if you see this simple calculation in which you take into account the inclination of the field and how the, uh, this um, converts into movement of the plasma, you may see this dependence uh, of the... Um, on the, of the, of the, on the velocity, on the, uh, on the vertical component, dependent on the cosine and sine of the inclination angle. So this effect is maximum at the equatorial, uh, at, at the mid latitude, and it's small at the uh, equatorial and high latitudes. Of course, if we neglect the fact that um, neutral wind may create polarization fields that can alter this, uh, this picture, um, but uh, the morphology of the magnetic field creates very important features at high, at high and low latitudes. So the dynamic of the plasma is ruled out by the E cross B drift. So the velocity of plasma depends on the vectorial product between the electric field and the, uh, and the magnetic field. And at the latitude, you remember that the um, magnetic field is nearly vertical, okay? If you remember the, uh, the, 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 the field line current I mentioned before, they create electric field which is horizontal. 
and in particular, you may see here the convection cells that are responsible for the electric fields in the, um, in the, uh, in the high latitude of the ionosphere. You may see uh, eight configuration of these convection cells depending on the relative balance between the Y and Z component on the, of the interplanetary magnetic field. So this creates a movement of plasma across the convection cells, which is called the tongue of ionization, which is especially intensified during the, um, um, during geomagnetic storm. So when you have entrance of particles from the outer space, from the magnetosphere down to, down to ionospheric uh, altitudes. So you have mainly particles enters in the, the dayside sector and they start to migrate, cutting into the, 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 the polar cup and create this large scale structure of the ionosphere that you will see again when we are going to talk, when we will talk about irregularities, which is called the tongue of ionization. So, and for instance, it's very important because it creates uh, gradients of density, which is the main trigger of some instabilities, like for instance, the calvin helmholtz instabilities you have been already heard about, you have heard about by, from Stefan before. The situation at low latitudes is different. The, um, the magnetic field is horizontal to the, uh, it's horizontal and the electric field now, it's uh, uh, direct into the east-west direction. It's, it is mainly created by the neutral winds that act in this way, you will see here the latitude as a function of the magnetic local time, so it's, the, it's a local kind of local time. And it creates this current system, this, it creates this um, current system which is called equatorial electrojet. So the net effect is that the, the um, equatorial electric field is directed into the east-west direction. The B is horizontal, so the net is the effect is to have a velocity of the plasma, which is in the um, up-down direction. In particular, it pushes the plasma up. And it creates this specific feature of the equatorial ionosphere, which is called the equatorial ionization anomaly. So in absence of the magnetic field, uh, you would have expected that the photoionization, the photoionization create a maximum exactly of the equator. It's like, it's like the, uh, it's like in the, in the normal weather, I will say. In this case, there is a pushing up of the, of the uh, ionospheric plasma that tends to get down of the magnetic field line, create these two peaks of ionization, which are called the crest of the equatorial anomaly. And you may see here a model simulation of the ionospheric density uh, as a function of the altitude. In this report, in this, in this nice review paper by Nanan Balan, published uh, five years ago, or five years and a half ago. And you will see this excess of uh, plasma located around 15, 20 degrees off the magnetic equator. Oops. And this creates one of the most, uh, of the largest ionospheric structure you may see. And this is actually this beautiful picture in which the two crests of the equatorial anomaly are nicely depicted. That's the full story for low latitude ionosphere. No, far from be true, because what do you expect? When the sun is disappearing over the horizon, the equatorial ionization anomaly should disappear somehow. Yes, but uh, these are the most unstable situation for the ionosphere because when you have the uh, passage of the solar terminator, there are also changes in the electrodynamics. In particular, there is a weakening of the E layer in the conductivity of the E layer and increase of the F layer conductivity. And this creates an uplift of the F layer. And the uplift of the F layer with respect to E layer create a bottom side gradient. It creates bubbles that tends to go up and then descend along the magnetic field line. 
creating the so, a so-called array retail or instability. And these are the most disrupting uh, effects for uh, trans-ionospheric or radio waves passing using the ionospheric layer for, for, for bouncing. These are called the equatorial plasma bubble. You will see here snapshot at different times of the, of the uh, simulation of the plasma bubble evolution, which tend then to be, there are plasma depletion that tends to grow, and then they start to grow also and to decay along the magnetic field line and create this small scale structure you will find uh, later in my presentation and in the presentation about the ionospheric irregularities I will give on Wednesday. These are, again, among the largest ionospheric structures. They can stretch up to 500, 600 kilometers in altitude, and they extend for a big band of, of, of latitude, as you may see in these nice plots from the, um, on the left. In plasma bubble are exactly uh, this. You may see these holes that are here, which are exactly the bubbles going up and decaying along the magnetic field line and covering a quite huge band. You will see uh, that they are a very regular, but not completely regular phenomenon occurring between at the equinoxes, mostly at the equinoxes under solar flux condition and are really a big trouble for, uh, for um, uh, Genesis based positioning, for instance. Okay, we have almost finished uh, the receipt. We have to steer everything to achieve the regular variation. So the most important regular variation you already seen is the, is the um, day and night variation. Uh, you may see here another way of thinking this. This is um, the mean daily variation of the total electron content uh, above Italy. So it's mid latitude, but it's sorted uh, into low, mid, and high latitude, Italian latitudes, okay? So it's not low latitude, it's Sicily, Rome, and Alps, I would say. And as you may see, um, Italy is uh, about plus one with respect to UT. So you may see here that you have a peak of ionization during the uh, during the daytime, which tend to decrease in the night, I mean, it's minimum uh, around midnight, around, uh, right up around midnight, and you have also a slight dependence on the latitude, so quite the, the lower the latitude, the higher the ionization. Okay. So, at mid, at mid latitude, um, as with the normal weather, less solar radiation translate to less, um, less photoionization. This is quite true, for instance, for the E-layer uh, uh, e behavior. The peak density during daytime, for instance, is lower in winter rather than in summer. But it's not completely true for the F-layer because you may remember that the dynamics of the plus, the, the, the morphology, the dynamics and the formation of the F2 layer is significantly influenced not only by the photoionization but also to the, process, the, to the transport processes I have mentioned before. So you start experiencing while well, you consider the, the F layer to some um, anomalies. I don't have time to go into the detail of these anomalies of the of the ionospheric behavior, which are called the winter anomaly, the annual anomaly, and the semi-annual anomaly, but I have put some slides for you. Uh, you will uh, get access. It's just in brief, I would like to mention that the winter anomaly is that you have a greater F2 layer peak density in the winter hemisphere than in the summer hemisphere during the solstices. In the annual anomaly is that you have a greater F2 layer peak density at global level during December solstice than June solstice. And the semi-annual anomaly is that the F2 layer peak density is greater at the equinox than at the solstice. Hmm? Another important part is that 
you know that the sun has a cycle, a cycle, half of a cycle, it's 11 years, and you may uh, spot this variability by monitoring the sunspot numbers or the F10.7, uh, uh, the F10.7, which is the flux at that specific wavelength, 10.7 centimeter, it behaves like this, or it's the way you can recognize and spot uh, minimum, uh, minima, maxima, and ascending and descending phase. So, what's the dependence on the ionospheric behavior on solar, on solar cycle? This is a um, paper published a couple of years ago, uh, investigating the total electron content over a GNSS receiver located in uh, low latitude, this is Africa, in Gabon, called Tang. And uh, you, this is, that's in blue, and in red you will see a sunspot number. You will see that the behavior of TC nicely follow the uh, behavior of the sunspot number. You will see also, you can also nicely draw a, a linear fit between the two. But this is true not only for a specific place on the Earth. If you consider what we call the global electron content, the global electron content is a measure of the total electron content at, at, at worldwide level. And this is reported as a function of the solar flux uh, at 10.7 centimeter. So there is a nice agreement between the, uh, the solar activity and the TC and the electron density in general. And have, we have to shake the ionosphere. So we have to shake with some irregular variation because are, they are the most somehow intriguing. If there are, were no irregular variation, we will probably not be here altogether to talk about these things. So you start realized, realizing today, maybe you already know, that uh, the, the, near, the near Earth space is a very complex environment. There are many processes. You can think in terms of exchange of mass and energy. You can think in terms of a change and changes and variation in currents. From whatever point of view, it's a mess. And this is probably the most famous, one of the most famous figure you may, you may see uh, when relating with this field, illustrating all the processes. Of course, every of this, uh, any of this, uh, of the, of these arrows will deserve a series of lessons. So this is just to give an idea, a brief idea, at a glance of the complexity of the situation. But the ionosphere is peculiar not only because it's exposed to the space geospace forcing, but it also exposed to forcing from below, from the lower layers of the atmosphere, through the so-called lithosphere, atmosphere, ionosphere coupling, which is becoming more and more important in the recent years. Okay, if we want to simplify the, the problem, we may say that there are three main sources of geospace forcing to the ionosphere, solar flares, solar flares, so neutral radiation suddenly impacting the ionosphere up to eight, uh, until uh, roughly eight minutes after, the, after the, they are launched from the, from the Earth. They are neutral, so they directly affect the ionosphere. There is no the, the, the magnetic field doesn't, doesn't matter for them, though the interplanetary magnetic field doesn't matter. And then there is the exchange of particle and energy through the coronal mass ejection and the high speed streams that affect the, the ionosphere through the coupling of, with solar wind and magnetosphere. And they have different um, response times. So it's about one to three days for coronal mass ejection. It can be, Few, uh, tens of minutes to a few hours for the fast proton and alpha particle constituting the high speed streams, for instance. So, again, this provides another proof of the complexity because also from the timing point of view, there are delays that must be taken into, into account. So, uh, I was talking with, uh, I don't remember, we, we do before, you're interested in flares, no? Am I right? Ah, no, you, you, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, what's the impact of the flares of the ionosphere? They are very fast. Hmm? They create extra ionization, increasing the density mainly of the D layer. So they create, they create a denser and, and thicker 
ionospheric D layer that absorbs everything, almost everything. You will see here, this is the, an example of the other top layer of curve. This is the, the strongest player in the recent past, the X9.3 player of the EU in the September 2017 score. The subsolar point was located near to, uh, to the EPC um, uh, 12. Uh, and it creates an absorption amplitude of 35 dBs. There is this guy is frequently affected by 1 dB absorption, so it almost blinded all the all the frequency in the in the HF range. And you can see there also the uh, roti. You it's a quantity uh, derived from GNSS. It's the time, it's the it's related with the time derivative of TC. So it demonstrates how fast the TC in the ionosphere change. And you may easily recognize that there is a kind of bomb <laughs> impacting the ionosphere. You will learn about these techniques also from the a talk from Tobias uh, tomorrow. Tobias, am I right? Okay. So this is, uh, it's quite, it's not that clear, but if you use HF radar called ionosong, you may reconstruct the bottom side of the ionosphere up to the peak layer. And on the, top, uh, on the top plot, you will see a typical ionogram. It's a good ionogram from an ionosong located in Rome. And this is the, exactly the same ionogram on the, during, the, um, during the flare. Uh, what you can see below is not matter of the figure. It's not a matter of the projector, nothing, because everything is absorbed. Every, every, um, every frequency emitted by the ionosphere is absorbed by the, the, the ionosphere, so you, can see, you, can, you can't see any echo from the ionosphere. You may also see jumps. I will put you a slide for you. Uh, yeah. I'm not, I don't have time to speak about, but you can also see clear jumps and fast jumps in total electron content. Let's go to the, to the charged part of the problem. So CME and uh, high speed streams. So when you have geoeffective storms, you have jumps in your, uh, you have flips in your, in your Z component of the IMF, you have increase of, uh, of flow speed and dynamic pressure and you can start to interact and influence the ionosphere um, starting from uh, the coronal mass ejection in high speed streams. So when a CME or a fast solar stream, solar wind, uh, solar wind streams hit the earth, the whole system reacts through the space, solar wind magnetosphere ionosphere system and there are a plethora of effects affecting the earth. You will have enhanced particle precipitation at a rural latitude. You have modification of the ionospheric current at high and low latitudes. You have modification of the neutral comp composition. You have heating of the ionosphere. You have displacement of the boundary of the rural oval. There are wave-like disturbances. You will, learn a lot. you will learn a lot in these days about traveling ionospheric disturbances. You have changes in the polar cap circulation. You have, change of, you have a, a plethora of events. Here there is an example, again, this is the roti, the, the quantity I've mentioned before, so the variation of TC. During the, the, during the June 2015 storm, again, one of the largest of the La Paz solar cycle, and you will see here, there's no way, there's no need to, to go into the details of what you see here, but you see there are many different phenomena affecting different parts of the ionosphere. You have to imagine this as a map as a flat ionosphere at 350 kilometers, okay? Because the GNSS is not able to resolve the, the height. So you see, the, you see activity and the high latitude, low latitude, mid latitude, really a plethora of events. The most intriguing part of the geomagnetic storm, the solar storm which translates into geomagnetic storm which translates into a ionospheric storm is the formation of ionospheric irregularities. I will speak about that on Wednesday. In general, you may, uh, you may know today that our plasma density variation with a general background smooth ionosphere, and they are created 
um, during, uh, but not only, uh, during geomagnetic storm, and they are or created or modulated, and are very important because the underlying phenomena are affect the a uh, lot of application like GNSS positioning, HF, HF communication. And the most important thing is that they range on a very large uh, scale, uh, scale they, are, say, they are featured by a large scale size range from centimeter up to 1,000 kilometers, 1,000 kilometer, okay? And uh, you can see here again the, uh, the plasma bubble the, the, the what they are called uh, the um, storm enhanced densities that affect mid latitude, the, the tongue of ionization and the crests. So, what happened in the high latitude ionosphere? So, mostly you have increased ionization to particle precipitation. On the left, you have the case of the electron density changes induced by the 2003 Halloween storm. On the right, you have a model which um, depict the electron density variation during the 2015 St. Patrick's Day storm. And I think that those animations speak, speak for, for, the, for themselves, for itself, because you see there are increase of ionization, increase of particle precipitation and waves that start to affect the, the rest of the, of the ionosphere. The peak here has already passed. These are the most, probably the, the two, the most toughest uh, storms of the, of the past, together with the September 2017 storm. Again, for what concerns the response of the high latitude ionosphere, there are changes in the shape and, and convection shell cells. These create different features related to the tongue of ionization, so how it is created and how the plasma tend to move across the polar cap and also tend to fragmentate because there are also instability processes occurring while the, plasma, the tongue of ionization uh, grow and moves across the polar cap. And of course, there is also a displacement of the aurora oval. These are the examples of two storms. So again, the 2015 St. Patrick's Day storm and 2002 storm, and this is the Halloween storm, this one, depicting various stages of this storm, again, in terms of this ROTI index, that are here just to demonstrate the highly dynamic environment, especially at high latitude. You may experience, if you want to study the formation of irregularity, is as a response to the geospace forcing. What happened to low latitude? The most um, important part uh, of the uh, low latitude is the fact that the, 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 the low latitude ionosphere is mostly ruled out by the electrodynamics. And the occurrence of a, ge of a, mag a geomagnetic storm alter alters the electrodynamics of the low latitude ionosphere. So this is the solar quiet conditions. This is the solar quiet um, uh, condition in the, in the uh, creating the equatorial electrojet I've mentioned before. When there is a, a flip of the BZ component of the, the planet magnetic field, there is a specific phenomenon called, called prompt penetration of electric field. The field and line current I mentioned before, the inner part are connected with the magnetosphere. The field and line current or region, region two, which are the, the one at lower latitudes, are connected with the ring current. And they react with different times to the geospace forcing. So the one connected with the magnetosphere tends to react first, creating an imbalance by these two current systems. And then, the region two field line current tends to balance this unbalance, initial balance. This creates the, some undershielding conditions that allows penetration of electric field from the magnetosphere down to the ionosphere through the ionospheric wave guide. And then this is at the flip, at the, at the southward flip of the magnetic field. So when BZ turns to negative values. And the opposite, and the opposite 
uh, happens in the, in the opposite condition. And this creates this penetration of electric field is a prompt response. It is, it is a shorter duration it's and it affects the electrodynamics for about, from about 30 minutes to two hours. Hmm? Then the ionosphere at high latitude start to heat up because there is particle precipitation that creates particle heating, jowl heating. So winds start to move, as you may see here, so traveling ionospheric disturbances. They, they start to move. Trans-equatorial wind starts to move and affect the electrodynamics of the low latitude ionosphere, create a delayed effect, which is called the disturbance dynamo electric field. So the resulting effect is an interplay between these two, with a, this prompt and delayed effect. And the most important thing is that it has a strong dependence on the longitudinal sector, on the local time dependence on the storm de of the storm development. This is a very nice example from a paper by Bruno Nava and other colleagues. These are three sectors, three geographical sectors, three longitudinal sectors, Asian sector, African sector, American sector, and this is the TC as a function of time and latitude for those three sectors. You may recognize before the storm, so here, quite nicely the signature of the crests of the equatorial anomaly. Thank you, you may see it. When the storm commence, you have strongly uh, displacement and strongly changes, strong changes, sorry, so strong changes and strong displacement of the crest of the equatorial anomaly, asymmetries, which are dependent on the longitudinal sector you are investigating. In particular, see in the Asian sector, sector at the peak storm peak, the, the, the crest signature completely disappear. And this also has an import, important effects also on the formation of plasma bubbles. So these are um, one of the most challenging things to, to model in the occurrence of irregularities in the low latitude sector. And there are still many efforts in place to understand how the storm time, the storm time behavior uh, affect the formation of the irregularity and also of the, of the crest uh, when, there, when uh, a uh, geospace forcing is, is pushing. What about uh, mid-latitude mid -latitude ionosphere? Uh, the, the most uh, striking uh, effect of the, uh, the mid-latitude is the so-called uh, positive and negative phases of uh, ionospheric storm. You may see here again two uh, examples taken from uh, uh, ionospheric measurements over Italy. Here on the top plot you have total electron content over Italy and below you have uh, the critical frequency of the, of the F2 layer which is directly proportional to the um, uh, Peak, uh, to the peak, to the frequency of the of the F2 layer again of a of a room. In red you have the median behavior, considering obtained con by considering the 20 say, 20, 70, 20, 27 days before uh, the specific um, the specific measurement. And in green you have the behavior. You may recognize that uh, the first days the first day. positive variation when the storm starts. In, par in particular, you have a positive phase and before, so there is a, an extra ionization with respect to the median uh, behavior and then a radical, radical, uh, lesser ionization uh, with respect to the median behavior in, in, the, in, the, in the second part of the storm. And this is uh, uh, quite uh, um, a regular response 
to the of the uh, mid latitude ionosphere sphere to the to geomagnetic storm in particular here you uh, the, in this in this uh, in this behavior the uh, variation in the neutral composition plays a significant role you may see here there is the uh, density of the neutral recorded by the use of the swarm satellites and you may see here this is from 22 to 25 exactly the same time range i don't know why the the, the dates are disappeared disappeared there with the KP index, so you may see the small increase in the, in the neutral density experienced by, recorded by the satellites. And you may see here in this very, it's a, it's a masterpiece of Michael, Professor Michael Mendillo about PC behavior. Uh, you may see also, you may also recognize different feature and different patterns of the negative and positive phase of this form. It's a very complex uh, uh, scenario, but most of them is ruled out by the changes in the neutral composition. What else about storm time behavior? So you will learn about, you will learn, you will learn about traveling ionospheric disturbances. I was mentioned before the um, uh, precipitation of particles uh, eats up the ionosphere in the high latitude sector. And this create winds, as you may see there, in this, in this modeling during the St. Patrick 2015 storm that tends to migrate to, to, lower, uh, to lower latitude and alter the, um, the, the, the plasma density by consequence. On the left, you will see the uh, DTEC. So you may recognize, you, if you want to recognize waves-like structure in your total electron content data, you have to detrend to highlight the oscillation and you will easily and nicely recognize this wave-like structure, for instance, here passing over the Europe, but also in the, over the American sector, that are actually the traveling atmospheric disturbances. There will be plenty of lectures dedicated to that in the next days. Besides large-scale uh, traveling atmospheric disturbances, there are also medium-scale uh, traveling ionospheric disturbances, and they are mostly, the TIDs in general, the, the most important ionospheric effect uh, at mid-latitude threatening uh, application like uh, positioning and HF communication. Uh, they are characterized by the different um, period, wavelength, and also um, typical variation with respect to the background ionosphere that carried out. And the interesting thing is that the traveling ionospheric disturbances are uh, created by a plethora of phenomena, especially the medium scale uh, TID. And you can see on the left an example of medium scale TID created by the rocket launches or the Falcon 9 rocket launch. This is uh, the case of probably you heard about it, the Unga Tonga Hawaii explosion which is becoming kind of the, what, what was the Halloween storm. It, it, it's, like it's a standard candle for the, for the lithosphere, ionosphere, atmosphere coupling. And you, here you can see the uh, passage of the wave over, over Japan. But there are also nuclear explosion, volcanic explosion, hurricanes, tornadoes, thunderstorms that creates a messy idea and are worth to be investigated because the ideas are silent accuracy killer because a, a GNSS receiver doesn't know if a TID is passing over his head, for instance. Okay, I'm going to, to conclude. So, some take home messages. The ionosphere is the upper atmosphere region containing a large concentration of electron ions due to the ionization of the neutron-atmosphere gases by solar ultraviolet and X rays. It's structured, it's vertical it's structure, it's com it is composed by layer, and it's formed by an interplay between ionization, production, loss, and transportation processes. The presence of the magnetic field is a fact, and it's important to understand the, um, the morphology and dynamics of the, of the ionospheric plasma. It has... Um, variation with altitude, local time, season, and solar activity level, which are usually re referred to uh, 
regular variation. As the ionospheric plasma has an impact on sub and trans ionospheric radio signal propagation, it's important to study ionosphere for many applications. Usually ionosphere is so, it's, it's delicate because from one end you, have to, you want to know about ionosphere, you need technologies, you need measurements, but from the other side you want to protect those instruments, technology from the effect you want to see. So it's always nice to understand in which side of the balance you want to put. And the regular and irregular behaviors is the, it's important to, to, to know because we need to understand um, what alter and how the ionospheric, ionospheric plasma is altered. And of course, the problem with the ionosphere is there's a, it's a complex environment with a compl it, it made by complex system in complex interaction among them. And you have to say always that you want to, to take into account the, cap the coupling with the geospace forcing and the forcing from below. And I thank you for your attention. Questions? Yes, there's one. <laughs> 